Hello. Welcome, everyone. My name is Daniel Moyer. I'm a sales support trainer here at Briggs & Stratton Energy Solutions. Uh, today, what we have for you is replacing lead-acid batteries with uh, lithium-ion batteries, specifically our Briggs & Stratton Phi batteries. So welcome. This class is not NAPSEP accredited. We're in the process of getting a lot of our courses accredited, but uh, up until then, we're going to um, get you some good content today. Uh, joining me today is Nathan Heston. He's kind of jumping in right now, uh, and we'll see him here in a second. Good morning, Nathan. Good Can you hear us? Good morning, Daniel. Good. How are good you? to have you. So what we're going to do quickly is, is just run through this course. This, again, is not NAPSEP accredited, but what I want to do is highlight the NAPSEP conference that is coming up. It's going to be happening um, coming up in March uh, this next month in Raleigh. If you're going to be there, let us know uh, in the either send us an email or put it in the Q&A uh, chat feature right now, and uh, we'll be sure to say hello to you. And if you come by the booth, I'll promise you a free sweatshirt, free hat, free pens, whatever you, whatever your heart desires. Um, on the screen is a QR code to register for that NABSEP. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk about off-grid living with Simplify batteries. So in a lot of ways, there's a lot of parallels to um, off-grid, right, and replacing lead-acid batteries. So we're going to dive into some of those concepts here and dive a lot of bit deeper when we're out there at NAPSEP. Uh, Nathan, you want to talk a little bit about what you're going to be talking about? Yeah, and in fact, I'm here at Distributech in Orlando, Florida, and I was just meeting with the trainers at Solark. I will be doing a talk on the Solark 15K featuring uh, Simplify Batteries, whole home backup, um, and looking forward to delivering that talk in NAPSEP. And just like Daniel said, uh, we'd love to see you there at NAPSEP. So if you are going to NAPSEP, go ahead and throw it in the chat and tell us what size sweatshirt you want. We'll bring one for you. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Another thing to announce is we're coming out with a new battery. It's a 6.6 .6 battery. Each one of those little stacks is 6.6 .6 kilowatt hours. So you can stack it up to 19.8 kilowatt hours. And I was kind of thinking about this, the stacking battery. And a lot of uh, our competitors and a lot of people in the market are, are going to these stacking batteries. And in a lot of ways, there's no reason you couldn't use one of these stacking batteries in, an, in a, to replace some lead acid batteries. But there's a lot of advantages to come that comes with our Phi battery that we're about to highlight here in a second. One of them being form factor. Um, the, the Phi 3.8 kilowatt hour battery I'm about to show you here in a couple of slides, it looks like a lead acid battery. It has the same kind of dimensions, the same form factors. So when you are looking to replace an existing lead acid battery bank, it's nice to be able to, to kind of take out the batteries and put these new lithium ion batteries in the same place, same battery cabinet, and not have to kind of reinvent the whole power shack uh, to accommodate a stacking battery. These stacking batteries cut down on commission time, install time, and really kind of makes them a little bit more error proof. There's not as many things to screw up with the comm wiring and, and the power wiring. So really excited to see this new battery being leveraged with Solark inverters, as well as our own uh, six, point, uh, 6 kilowatt inverter, which you see on the screen there to your right. Scan this QR code and get on the mailing list uh, for upcoming announcements on this battery. And if you happen to be at Distributech or have somebody that are, is here at Distributech, uh, swing by our booth. Yeah. Um, we are we are there. We have this battery in person. You can see a demo of it. You can interact with our Energy Track app here as well. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. And and that's a good thing that Nathan pointed out there is the Energy Track app. As we're starting to move into this kind of revolution of energy storage, we're we're putting these batteries on homes, it, almost becoming sort of an appliance. One of the crucial things to make these batteries work for people and installers is software. And Nathan hinted at it. He mentioned our Energy Track app, which allows fleet control from the uh, installer perspective, but also allows the homeowner to have visibility on what's going on with their battery and be able to, to control certain aspects of it, perhaps setting a reserve level if you know a big storm's coming in. So very important software is playing a bigger uh, role in our industry than ever before. Briggs & Stratton, it, it's really a company that's been around that has a lot of history that's now partnered with Simplify Power to be this one complete energy solutions provider. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later, but off-grid systems historically have always had generators associated with them. And here at Briggs & Stratton Energy Solutions, we can provide you the generators, we can provide you the batteries, one tech support call, one sales rep, one warranty, all under one solution. This is the battery. 
Uh, here it is. Uh, this is the Phi battery that you see there on the left. It's 3.8 kilowatt hours. And what's really allowed these lithium ion batteries to, to kind of uh, mature to the point where we can start to think about taking out those trusty, tried and true lead acid batteries is this, this new chemistry. Lithium iron batteries come in many different flavors, many different chemistries. We've been leveraging the lithium iron phosphate chemistry since the beginning of our company. And we found, and a lot of other of our competitors are finding that it's the safest, has the best cycle life, and it's also be able to provide you the, the reliability. And so we not only leverage this, this awesome chemistry, the lithium iron phosphate, but also the cylindrical cell form factor. That's not as big of a um, kind of selling point anymore. There's a lot of other advancements coming in some of the other uh, form factors. But again, to be able to have this, this highly energy dense chemistry that can be discharged quickly and charged quickly and have a very low self-discharge rate and be, and most importantly, safe is, is really kind of revolutionized home energy storage. And, and we've had a lot of these other parts and pieces like charge controllers and inverters, um, automatic generator starts, fuses, right? The, these other parts and pieces have been around for a long time. But what hasn't been around is this uh, low cost, relatively low cost, reliable, um, energy storage battery that now we can leverage not only in our home uh, on-grid situations, but now we're starting to investigate here in the off-grid situations as well. One thing I want to keep in mind, I'm going to show you pictures a little bit later. When we historically did lead-acid batteries, a lot of times we'd use 6-volt batteries, maybe even 2-volt batteries or 12-volt batteries and wire them up in series to create parallel strings to build up to the uh, nominal voltage that the equipment requires, maybe 48 volts or 24 volts. When we're dealing with these Phi batteries, we're always going to want to run them in parallel. And so if you got a 48 volt system, buy our 48 volt batteries. These batteries come in either 24 or 48 volts. Don't go out and buy two 24 volt batteries uh, and wire them up in series. Buy either the 48 or the 48 volts. It can really scale up to the size you need. And it makes, again, kind of that perfect drop-in lead acid replacement. Uh, it does have the integrated battery management system, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And additionally, you can see up top, it has a breaker. So you can turn the batteries off, right? How can you, you can't really turn a lead acid battery off, but you can absolutely turn our battery off. That allows for a little safer install. If you ever have to do troubleshooting, it allows you to shut off batteries and kind of test batteries individually with the breakers as well. And just to reiterate what Daniel yeah. said, we, we never wire our batteries in series like we would do with the lead acids, right? And, and one of the reasons for that is any current coming out of that first battery would have to pass through the BMS of the second battery. And, and the BMS units themselves are, are limited in the amount of current that they can handle. So we often get that question, can I just put two of the 24 volt batteries together to, to power my 48 volt system? The answer is no, you cannot do that. Always wire in parallel, as Daniel said. I, I, Nathan, I just saw a question come in and, and um, Chris is asking, am I correct that the Phi 3.8 does not offer closed loop communications? And, and you're absolutely right, it does not. And, and there's not that, that not having closed loop communications make this battery any less reliable, any less safe. It's that if you are replacing lead acid batteries, most likely you have some older pieces of equipment, like some old Outback or some old Schneider or some old Morningstar, um, you name it, right? It, that p older piece of equipment can't leverage the closed loop communications, even if the battery did have it. So why buy something more expensive? We do offer this battery in the Amplify version that does have closed loop communications, but having a battery that doesn't have closed loop communications, I think is becoming more rare in the industry. And, and again, what this means is if it doesn't have closed loop communications, we're gonna talk about this. It's very important that we program and uh, size the other parts and pieces of the uh, um, system to treat the, the batteries the way they want to be treated. Because without closed loop comms, um, the, the batteries can't necessarily tell the inverter or tell the charge controller how to behave. So it's absolutely true. They do not have closed loop communications. One thing we have- So our on, batteries yeah, that do have the closed loop communications, Daniel, as you mentioned, you know, the Amplify is essentially the same battery as that Phi battery. It's got the same good quality battery pack in there. 
Um, the real difference is that computer, right? And, and the Phi battery has a BMS that is still fairly sophisticated and high-end BMS inside it. It just doesn't offer the closed loop communications. And we do that, as Daniel said, because not all pieces of equipment offer closed loop communication. So why pay for it if you're not going to use it? Um, so our batteries with closed loop are the Amplify, the 4.9 kilowatt hour battery as well. So the Amplify comes in a 3.8, the 4.9 has closed loop communications and our new 6.6. And the new 6.6, absolutely. Another difference between the Amplify and the, the um, Simplify and the Phi is that the Amplify, the ones with closed loop communications comes with a 15 year warranty. With the Phi, we're still offering a very, attractive, very aggressive 10-year warranty. And I will say that a 10-year warranty that we're offering is unlimited cycles at 100% depth of discharge without a throughput um, clause, right? So a lot of other competitors might say a certain number of cycles at a certain percent depth of discharge and only a certain amount of energy you can put into the battery and take out of the battery. Whichever comes first, your warranty is up. We really wanna make this a true workhorse of an off-grid system where you're gonna be cycling the system usually once a day, right? We're gonna discharge the battery in the, the evening, throughout the night, and in the morning, and then give the chance uh, for sun and the solar to recharge the battery during the day. So we're gonna let you use this battery as a workhorse. Um, if you do choose to, to cycle it all the way down, we will warranty at 80% retained uh, capacity at the end of that uh, warrantied life. So again, 10 years on the Phi, 15 years, same clause, unlimited cycles, 100% depth of discharge, no throughput clause on the other batteries. So what are we looking at here? On the right, you know, and I got a, a, another slide coming up on this is that this is what some Outback charge controllers, an Outback uh, inverter right here. Um, and I see the Mate 3S, I believe that's up there on the top left here. Uh, we see a, some lead acid batteries on the left there, and this is what we replaced them with, right? We took out all of those 16 of those batteries. They're probably six volt batteries if I had to guess, but you can see the, the corrosion and the sulfation on those batteries on the left. We're able to easily drop in our lead acid battery replacements. They kind of fit in that same area, that same kind of physical space that was there. Um, so a lot of these systems have either a sealed lead acid batteries like gel or AGM, or they have flooded lead acid batteries, right? And that those batteries usually, if depending upon how you treat them, uh, only going to last four to five years or so. So what we want to do is rather than come in and replace them with new lead acid batteries, let's have a conversation with the homeowner about replacing them with lithium ion batteries. Again, well, we're going to talk about this, that it it's gonna be more money, right? The amount of money you would cost to replace those lead acid batteries uh, with a whole brand new set is gonna be less than it would be to put in lithium ions. I would argue of any brand, not only ours, but what we wanna do is help the homeowner look past that upfront price and have them look at or her the uh, long, the, the, the cost of having the batteries over the lifetime. Understand that these, Lithium ion batteries might last twice as long, um, might not have to, they're not gonna have to be maintained. So if the homeowner forgets to water the batteries, uh, they're not gonna have a short life. So it, it's really exciting to be able to come in and replace lithium ion batteries. And that's what this talk is all about. Keep in mind that that Outback uh, Radian, or I believe it's a Radian there, and that Outback charge controllers, that's relatively newer equipment. So we we know that we can program those charge controllers and those inverters, uh, the set points like the float, the bulk, the low battery cutout voltage to treat our lithium ion batteries the way they wanna be treated. If you have some older pieces of equipment, uh, you may have to think about re you know redesigning those or, or replacing the kind of that balance of system as well. What's nice about some of this newer equipment too is it can, if for whatever reason you are grid tied, be a grid interactive system as well. So Nathan, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you want to talk a little bit about this. Um, what kind of happens and in, in when we have a lead acid battery bank, um, what can happen kind of on a phys the physics level? I know you're a physics professor at, at Cal Poly, so I, I really want to hear your insights. But um, you know, what kind of causes sulfation of, of batteries when we undercharge them? Uh, and then kind of what can happen to a uh, lead acid battery when we overcharge them? 
So you're kind of putting me on the spot am, here, Daniel. Nathan. And I have I have not looked at these um, oxidation reduction reactions in some time for some time. Um, but essentially, what can happen is you can get uh, solid sulfur deposits um, from the sulfuric acid uh, inside those batteries on the lead plates. And as that builds up, as those uh, solid sulfur deposits build up, it prevents the acid from ac accessing the surface areas of the plates. And so you you end up losing capacity off those batteries. Um, and typically what is done is monthly you'll have, you know, typically it's about once a month you would do an equalization charge. And what that does is it provides a high voltage, high uh, charging voltage um, to get those sulfur deposits to break up and, and come off of those plates. Um, yeah. You could also get those deposits as well um, if you're not properly uh, watering your batteries and maintaining the uh, appropriate um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking the word for uh, concentration there, Daniel, that's, um, that we use with, <clears throat> with our uh, meters to, mal to, ba to, to monitor the concentration of sulfuric acid. Um, yeah, the, blanking on uh, that. Yeah, the, um, it's the hydrometer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to think about that too, the specific gravity, <laughs> maybe a specific yes. gravity. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank that you. for putting you on the spot, Nathan, that was an amazing answer. And, and thank you for, for addressing that. And one thing we want to be very careful is that if you do have some older lead acid batteries with some older piece of equipment, you need to get in there and reprogram those older pieces of equipment. So you disable that equalized charge, or you could damage the new lithium ion batteries, which do not require that equalization charge as well. If you're overcharging the batteries, really, you're just going to you're going to boil the batteries, right? You're going to start boiling the, the electrolyte in there and, and you're going to start to get a lot of off gassing right there. Um, and, and you're going to potentially, you know, cause a lot of hydrogen gas to maybe catch fire as well. So this is what can happen with lead acid batteries as they age out as well. This was that example I was talking about earlier. I showed you that picture of that Outback piece of equipment. We took 16 batteries um, and we replaced them with five of our five batteries. And I just want to kind of show you how the math behind how that was able to work, right? That And I'm making a little assumptions here, but I was assuming that those batteries were six volt batteries, probably very similar to this Trojan battery I'm showing you here on the left here. They're 225 amp hours at six volts. What means is that each battery is about 1.3 kilowatt hours. 16 of those gives you about 21 kilowatt hours. But I was also making the assumption that that Outback inverter was probably programmed to only discharge those batteries down to about a 50% depth of discharge. Because if you start to really cycle these batteries down, you're really going to shorten the cycle life. So a lot of times we'd always program for a 50% depth of discharge. What that gives you is about 10,000 kilowatt hours or 10,000 watt hours, 10 kilowatt hours. We were able to come in with some lithium ion batteries, specifically our five batteries here. Each one of our five batteries is 75 amp hours at 48 volts, which means each one of them is, well, what I'm showing you here is 3.6 kilowatt hours. And I, I did that kind of on purpose to keep the math simple. Really, we, we rated a lot of these batteries at their nominal voltage, which would be closer to 50 volts or 51 volts. And 51 times uh, 75 is closer to that 3.8 kilowatt hours, which is what I was, um, that's, which is what we call this battery here as well. But let's stick with the 3.6 here just to keep the math simple. That gives us about, you know, if we only have four of them, about 14,000 kilowatt hours. But we're able to discharge our batteries all the way down to 100%. I'm still not going to do that with my lithium ion batteries, though. Really, what I want to do is do kind of a 20% state of charge or an 80% depth of discharge. And if you do that to our batteries, you can expect about 10,000 cycles on our batteries. So what we're wanting to do the math right. And so what we end up getting is about 11,000 watt hours or 11 kilowatt hours. So it's about the same. We can take four of our lithium ion batteries and replace 16 of our lead acid batteries in a bank. And we noticed in that picture a couple of times ago, they chose to go with five. So they upped it a little bit to a little bit size or a little larger size. I will tell you also this to kind of keep the math simple is that the, the, capacity, the amp hours of that Trojan battery was at a C over 20 discharge rate. And if you start to charge discharge that battery quicker, 
uh, you're going to get less amp hours out of it. But I kind of kept the mass simple with our um, buy battery here. It's a C over two discharge rate as well. So Daniel, yes. you mentioned uh, discharging to a depth. So we talk about usable capacity in batteries, right? Often batteries are simply just labeled as the number of amp hours you can get out of them if you draw them down to zero, right? But but truly, even a deep deep cycle lead acid battery, you're only looking at maybe 50% of those amp hours, right? And you mentioned using 80% of the number of amp hours of the, in that five battery and getting 10,000 cycles. We often get the question, you know, how many cycles would you get if you do a 90% depth of discharge or, or 100%? Um, and then is there any benefit to only discharging to 70% depth of discharge? So could you speak a little bit about depth of discharge, why 80% is that, that, that magic number for us or the number that you would use as opposed to 90 or 100%? Yeah, 90% depth of discharge in our batteries is probably going to give you closer to uh, 5,000 cycles, right? And remember, cycles, you charge a battery and discharge a battery completely. Doing 100% depth of discharge, you might get 3,500 cycles out of it. Now, in an off-grid situation, I would say, yes, let's size it for an 80% depth of discharge. If we did have an application maybe where it's just a standby power, um, and I'm thinking of an on-grid home that's not able to, to really cycle the batteries as kind of a standby situation, let's go ahead and design or size the battery bank, assuming 100% depth of discharge, because we know we're not going to be cycling the battery a lot. Um, so again, we chose 80% because it gives us that most cycle life. And, and with 70% depth of discharge, right? I, I, we probably would get a few more cycles out of it, but 10,000 cycles cycling once a day, that's like 27 years. So, um, you know, after that many years, right, I would not really want necessarily to, to go to 70% because we're not really going to get that much more out of it. Nathan, did you have any other comments on that? Well, I, th I think that's a great answer. One of the reasons why, I mean, this is an off-grid talk, right? You are going to cycle those batteries daily. I was talking with a customer that's running one of our inverters on a 208 system for his condo today. Um, and he's just running, he's, he's got these batteries just in case power goes out as it does frequently here in Florida. And I had him um, set his system up for hundred percent depth of discharge, but he's only going to be discharging his batteries. It's just a battery backup system, right? There is no solar, there's no inverter. He's only going to discharge his, his batteries in case of an outage. Um, and so, yes, it does depend on the application, you know, still it, he's not going to have 3,500 outages. He'll get plenty of years out of his system, but for an off-grid system, that's why we're, we're choosing that 80% is we get those 10,000 cycles as opposed to that 3,500 on a hundred percent depth of discharge. And, and just so, so we're clear. Good that, answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And just to be clear. So that, that gentleman that Nathan's referring to, had he sized the system for an 80% depth of discharge, he might've had to buy a, an extra battery or an extra two batteries. And by leveraging the complete fuel available in the battery, he's able to kind of have a, a smaller battery bank, knowing that he's still going to get the same overall life of the, the system as well. One thing I want to be careful, and again, we already talked about this, that the uh, Phi batteries do not have closed loop communication. So they're not able to talk to the inverter to let them know, hey, there's only four batteries here, there's only three batteries here, uh, don't exceed our maximum charge or discharge uh, ability. So we talked earlier, each battery has a C over two discharge rate. And so if it's a 3.8 kilowatt hour battery and we kind of kept it in kilowatts, that means we could continuously charge or discharge our five batteries at about 1.9 kilowatts. And so if we have that outback radian right there, that's able to push either 8,000 watts into the batteries or take 8,000 watts out of the batteries. We want to make sure we have enough batteries there so that if ever that that outback is being called upon to provide 8,000 watts to loads, we're not going to exceed the, the max discharge rate of the batteries. So if we got 8,000 watts divided by 1,900, it's probably a little bit over four batter or five batteries is what I'm going to want to see for that. So in this example, you notice there's a lot more than five batteries because they're sizing the system to meet the energy needs of the this system rather than the power needs. So again, kind of the take home on this slide is the battery kilowatt hours should be sized to twice the in inverter's kilowatt output capability. You don't necessarily have to remember any of that because why? Because we have a lot of great resources on our website. Um, 
scan this QR code. It's going to take you to our website. And what you're going to find is uh, an electrical load calculator. That's going to help you size an off-grid system uh, just to kind of get an idea of how much solar and batteries you'll need. There's another quick FI in the system FI based calculator. It starts to take into account um, what kind of inverter you're using, what kind of depth of discharge, and what kind of um, loads you are going to be expecting. And will tell you how many batteries you're going to need in that system. Finally, the one that's most applicable to this talk is our lead acid battery replacement calculator that simply takes what you got there. You know, I got 16 six volt batteries at 220 amp hours and I'm discharging them down to 50%. How many five batteries do I need to replace that system? The answer was four. We already looked at that math earlier. Um, but again, kind of the, the take home here again is is lithium ion batteries when compared to lead acid batteries are able to be charged and discharged much quicker. Um, there's no ventilation, right? So we don't have to worry about off gassing as well. There's no specific gravity checks. There's no hydrogen off gassing. And, and really they're able to kind of mount in that exam, same kind of uh, physical space that you might have otherwise had uh, for those lead acid batteries. You want to also make sure that you're properly programming those other pieces of equipment. So we have integration guides available on the website, and we're going to take a little bit closer look at one here in a second. Uh, so Nathan, uh, you know, have you ever heard of a lead acid battery having a battery management system? Or would, you know, is lead acid battery is cheap and probably the battery management system is going to be uh, more expensive than the battery. But have you ever heard of, of somebody leveraging a battery management system in a lead acid battery? And would you see any need to do that? I have not. Um, I have installed lead acid batteries. And when we've done, you know, when we've run several in parallel, I've been careful to size the cabling um, to try to preserve states of balance. Um, but it's it's much more crucial with lithium batteries where that state of charge versus voltage is a much flatter uh, curve. And I think you'll probably talk a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not comprehensive in terms of lead acid familiarity, um, but to my knowledge, uh, people do not really use BMS systems with lead acids. Yeah, BMS. Thank you for that, that answer. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, but battery management systems are really important and imperative to lithium ion batteries. Really, um, we, we're, they're in there to one is to do cell balancing as well, um, protect the battery from abuse. Now it's not gonna be a lifeguard from the battery, but the batteries do have a, a contactor or some have FETs that are able to open up the battery and protect itself. Um, again, we wanna make sure that it's not gonna protect it from everything that can possibly go wrong. So we wanna make sure we properly size um, our systems, properly program our other inverters and charge controllers, and make sure that they're compatible to work with our inverter, our, our batteries as well. This is that the slide that um, Nathan was just referring, or the, the kind of concept I was just referring to. It, it can be difficult to determine the state of charge of a lithium ion battery based solely on its voltage. Um, with the lead acid battery, it's relatively easy. And, and again, you want to show that this is um, a resting voltage at a, at a certain temperature. As soon as we start to in, uh, um, kind of put in other variables like, like temperature and charge and discharge rates, um, it can become even more challenging to determine the state of charge of a battery based solely on its voltage. And why? If you look at the, uh, the y-axis here, we're seeing battery voltage. On the x-axis, we're seeing a depth of discharge or, or essentially how much juice is left in the battery. And with a lead acid battery, between an 80% battery and a 40% state of charge battery, basically going from almost full to kind of getting empty battery, there's a six volt difference, differential between the, the, those states of charge. With a lithium ion battery, it's only half a volt. So we have to be careful. Um, and there's other pieces of equipment, like um, I'm thinking of a, a BM, Victron BMS 712, uh, something that has a shunt that's able to measure amps in and amps out that can then give us a more accurate measure of the state of charge of a battery. And, and think about integrating some of those other parts and pieces in there as well. And there it is. That's the 712 right there. Uh, there's other parts and pieces. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the old days. Um, there's some other pieces of equipment that 
I'll, I'll think of it um, as, as we get along here that can essentially use shunts to measure amps in and man, amps out. Again, the battery management system cannot alone fully protect the battery. You need to make sure we size the battery bank to be twice the size in kilowatt hours of the inverter output um, and make sure that we get those low battery cutout voltage, the bulk, the absorb, the float, disable, equalize, um, and make sure we set those max charge, discharge and charge currents as well. What we do wanna make sure though, is that that pieces of equipment, the inverter, the charge controller are compatible to work with lithium ion chemistries. Uh, make sure that you can adjust the set points to what we're gonna call out on our uh, integration guides, which I'm about to show you an example here in a second. Um, and make sure you can set the absorb time um, or the end amps to meet the criteria that we're looking for. A lot of times we do with lead acid batteries, um, you, you can, in some of the older pieces of equipment, we can start a generator to charge up the batteries. And one way we can do that is we can, um, we can use an external charger and IOTA. IOTA has always been a go-to, not only for a DC to DC voltage converters, but also for battery chargers as well. Um, this IOTA is a, is a great workhorse. What I'm showing you there is the DLS 5413. It's a little hard to read that. And, and it's important to understand the difference between a battery charger and a power supply. A lot of times when we're looking to charge up our batteries or if one of our batteries has gone into a protective state, uh, because of uh, some sort of transitory voltage, we need to kind of jumpstart the battery. And how we do that is with a power supply. So a power supply usually provides amps to um, uh, a load, regardless of whether or not it's seeing voltage on that other end. Whereas a battery charger usually won't start charging a battery unless it sees um, a certain voltage range on that battery. So uh, this is the uh, the IOTA. This is the go-to one. Everybody who, who joined us for this talk is going to get a copy of these slides. And I have it linked right there as well. So, Daniel, yes, you mentioned the, the importance of uh, the difference between a power supply and a battery charger. Uh, what, are, what are those key differences? A, a, a battery charger would probably have a, a bulk cycle be current limited right, as opposed to voltage limited. So if I took a battery at a 0% state of charge, a lithium battery, and immediately applied 56 volts to it, I could be running very high currents, right, into that battery. Um, so typically, those those chargers will be current limited um, and will be running a, a, you know, a, a, an adjustable or a set amount of current in um, so as not to overheat the battery, so as not to charge it too fast. Any other key differences? Yeah, you know, well, one, I mean, besides the differences, the, I would say the quality of IOTA is, is definitely kind of that workhorse. It's going to cost you a lot more as well. But yeah, that brings up a good point, Nathan. And, and I do believe IOTA has the ability to um, have little programming kind of dongles that can be inserted into this IOTA. And, and I will say, again, to keep, I don't get paid by IOTA, but I just like them, uh, that this can be either or. Uh, so like Nathan mentioned, it can uh, act as a battery charger or a power supply as well. I would say maybe another one is the uh, duty cycle, right? A battery charger is meant for uh, kind of just get your car charged up and then get you off to um, down to the, get, hopefully to go get a new battery for your car because it's died or you need to drive it. Whereas a power supply might have a uh, a more robust duty cycle that allows you continuous power. Integration guides on our website, Simplify Power uh, website is these integration guides and what they, we, we have them for many different uh, manufacturers. Um, what I'm showing you here is the Outback, because we've been showing you a lot of examples of Outbacks. And what it's telling us here, and I'm not going to go through all of this, is, is how to program the Outback charge controller on the left and the Outback inverters on the right, usually in the order in which those pieces of equipment ask for it. So it kind of tells you in the inverter setting on the battery charging tab, set the absorb to this, set the absorb time to that, um, you know, you know, the, you can't disable equalize, but set the equalize time to zero. And that essentially will disable the equalize. Um, so these are really powerful guides that really make it easy for you to program these pieces of equipment. Uh, check them out online uh, on our website. 
This is going back to the um, the difference between the price of batteries and the and the lifetime kind of um, um, cost of batteries over the life, right? So if you were just look up the upfront price, everybody would want lead acid batteries because they're cheaper than just replace my lead acid batteries, life for life. Let me get going. But if we take a moment to step back and, and have a conversation with the homeowner and explain to them, I have something else that I can offer you. It's going to be a little more, maybe even some a lot more upfront, but it could the batteries are going to last twice as long or even three times as long um, as these lead acid batteries. And how we get to that is we have some math available and, and you tell the homeowner, you don't have to believe me. Uh, there's a website calculator that we can go through and show you. Um, that's the QR code to get to this calculator available online. And what it does is it takes the price of the battery, divides it by the capacity, the warranted number of cycles, the round trip efficiency, and the depth of discharge you plan to run the battery at, plus not even including all those ancillary costs. And you can show that the, um, the batteries um, do truly have a, lev a better lifetime cost as well. Now, Nathan, um, I'm going to put you on the spot again here. Um, you know, we talk about round trip efficiencies of lithium ion batteries. How does that compare to lead acid batteries? Well, that's a that's a great question, Daniel. You know, it so some of the round trip efficiency, of course, um, it depends on the inverter. But I think you're you're more specifically asking about the amount of energy lost um, in the battery. Uh, yes. itself from the charging yeah. and, and discharging uh, process. Um, so lithium is an extremely light ion. Um, so when you're actually moving lithium between the plates of a lithium battery, you are not having to supply a large amount of energy to get those lithium atoms to move. Um, in the case of uh, lead acid batteries, you're looking at uh, much larger ions moving. You're looking at you know, a sulfate ion, a sulfur with oxygen, so heavier. So I don't know exactly the um, the round trip efficiency of lead acid batteries, and that would just be a better answer if I just gave you that exactly. But from a fundamental level, um, lithium is extremely efficient in that regard. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about using sodium ion batteries, but the drawback to them, of course, is, is lower efficiency um, and, and reduced cycle life. Um, and we have similar similar problems with lead acid batteries, right? When we compare it to lithium, lower cycle life and reduced efficiency. So unfortunately, I can't give you a you know ballpark estimate on round trip efficiency of a lead acid battery. It also has to do with the, the char you know charge discharge rate of the battery itself, what type of battery it is. Um, so deep cycle batteries, for instance, have uh, large amounts of uh, you know thicker plates. Um, to allow them to to last much longer, um, uh, so it it all depends on on that. But yes, lithium is maybe two to three times more efficient. You can you can have you know you're really only losing one to two percent efficiency depending on your charge rate when you're charging or discharging a, a lithium battery. In the case no. of acid, it's a few few more percent. Yeah, no, that's great, and I think that's the exact answer I was looking for. We all know that uh, lithium ion batteries are, have a more efficient round trip, but we didn't know why um, and the physics behind it. So thank you, Nathan, for that answer. And um, we can look up some of those other round trip efficiencies, but again, understanding the, the fundamentals, that's why uh, we like giving these trainings to everyone is to dive just deeper into saying, oh, we're more efficient, but to get the, the great answers like Nathan provided, thank you, Nathan, uh, for explaining why things are like the way they are. Um, this is me. Sure. Thinking, and, yes, you know, Jen, but we all we all, we all know, right, that our, our batteries get hot when we use them. Right. And that heat, of course, is inefficiency. That's that's converting some of that energy we want to power our devices into heat. It's waste. Um, and you've probably noticed that your phone gets a lot hotter um, when you're drawing a lot of power from it, uh, both because when you are discharging the at high rate, the efficiency is lower. And also because you're pulling more power from it. Um, but there, there is, you know, the faster you discharge a battery, the faster you charge a battery, the lower your round trip efficiency is going to be as well. So keep that in mind. You know, yeah. the standard, um, the standard testing conditions for round trip efficiencies on lithium batteries is a C over five. 
right? The standard testing conditions for a lead acid battery is C over 20. And I can see it on your screen there, right? Um, and so it's, it's not, we're not comparing apples to apples when, even when we are comparing round trip efficiencies, right? Yeah. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind that lead acid batteries um, are not entirely comparable. People want to say, how many amp hours is that battery? Um, right. In terms of capacity, well, how many usable amp hours is yeah. the battery? Right. Yeah. So, and, and, anyway, and, yeah, maybe no, more than a, we wanted here. No, I think that's what we're getting into it. And that's what we do is get into the weeds. And I will, you know, there's very, I think, rare situations where you ever would discharge our batteries at a continuous C over two rate. You know, that's discharging an entire battery bank in two hours. Um, so and then we recognize, you know, that C over 20 rate, probably we're not going to discharge the batteries that slowly either. So it's definitely some a middle ground on here. Back to what we're looking at here though, is, is the levelized cost of energy. So for those, um, those L16s, I think they're right there in the middle, those Trojans, those four batteries probably cost less in the picture on the left, which is showing us two five batteries upfront price. But when we start to look at the levelized cost of energy, and we think about how much does it cost for every watt hour we put into the battery and for every watt hour we take out of the battery over its lifetime, we can show using that calculator that indeed it is a more lifetime cost effective to go with a lithium ion chemistry, uh, any lithium ion chemistry. I mean, ideally, yeah, our five battery is great and I want you to buy our five, but but again, this, this holds true for a lot of other um, manufacturers that you can see um, that long-term return um, if you look past the upfront price on our batteries as well. Um, really quickly, we're, we're kind of making it quickly through this one. Um, there's more usable capacity. We already talked about that. Uh, lower self-discharge rate on these lithium ion batteries, which means that you can have them in a, say a summer, a winter, a summer cabin sitting stationary. Know that when you come back in spring, those, those batteries are still going to have a lot of do, do, um, uh, energy left in them no maintenance, right? If you forget to water the batteries, you're not going to have a very long life of those batteries. So even if you have the recombiners and everything, uh, not having to worry about watering, it means lower maintenance as well. Um, so again, think so about- So Daniel, the, you just yes. made, a, you made a great point. You know, I, um, I'm from an area in Northern Pennsylvania where we have a lot of hunting cabins, where we have people that go away for months at a time. Um, and the, the self-discharge rate of lithium batteries is on the other 1%. I was just speaking with somebody earlier today that hasn't touched their batteries in six months. Um, and then we turn their system on, they're still at 90%, right? It's 1% a month under, under typical conditions. It, it increases a little bit uh, uh, if there's a lot of humidity in the air or if the temperature is a bit higher, but still, you know, you can you can leave your batteries um, as long as the breakers turned off and come back many months later um, and still have full batteries. So it's a nice point. And lead acid discharge is about five times faster self discharge. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, um, you know one of the other and again a lot of you know we think of off grid as people that live off grid, but there's a lot of off grid installations where there there's these kind of part time systems. Or maybe even in an, I would think of an RV or one of your a camper trailers as an off-grid system as well. And, and we do have uh, some talks where we go a little bit more into that as well. So, well, Daniel, yes. um, Fred asks, what's the recommended method for maintaining civil batteries in stock pending installation or, or sales? There's not much to it. Um, you know, make sure that when you do go to install the, the batteries for the first time, that understand sometimes when we ship these batteries because of Department of Transportation Regulations, DOT, that we have to sometimes ship the battery at less than a full state of charge. So make sure we get a full state of charge, one full bulk absorb cycle on the batteries before you start to turn on loads as well. Um, anything to add yeah, to that? That's a good point, Daniel. I just want to add that um, with our with our closed loop communicating batteries, those were allowed to ship at a higher states of charge. So the Amplify, the 4.9, uh, the 6.6 .6 batteries are likely all um, going to arrive to you at a 90% state of charge.
But as Daniel mentioned, Department of Transportation regulations around uh, R5 batteries uh, require us to ship, I believe it's below 40% uh, yeah. uh, state of charge. Yeah, I thought it was and you'll 30. Do, you will need to do a full charge cycle. Okay, 30%. And you need to do a full charge cycle before that commissioning. You want to uh, top those battery, batteries off uh, before you start that system from using the energy. Thank you, Nathan. One thing, Nathan, also you had mentioned earlier is we never want to run our batteries in series or is in parallel. Um, and you mentioned why, because of the battery management system. One way we do run our batteries in parallel, there's a couple ways we can do it. One is using our bus bars. What you're looking at the middle of our screen right now is our Boss 12 cabinet with 12 batteries. And we have bus bars that run uh, and if you notice, also these bus bars run, you know, one side, we got a, our positive coming off and the other side, we got our negative coming off. And then we land them on terminal blocks. And this is a picture of one of the terminal blocks here. It may not be the exact one we use. And you could theoretically not even use this cabinet and, and have these bus bars and use terminal blocks to then create more parallel connections to then have much larger conductors to do the home run. Uh, Victron makes a, a lot of different battery combiners. Midnight Solar, which is on the top right there you're seeing, has a, a battery combiner. When you are running our batteries uh, to a combiner, be sure to use conductors of the same gauge and the same length uh, going to the combiner so that each battery is gonna work just as hard as the next uh, in the system. And when you're not seeing any uh, resistance um, between certain battery cables and others. This is a, a great example of what it can look like to do a lead acid battery replacement here. On the left there is, is some, looks like some Trojans there and you can see them all paralleled up. Um, and I do see some, um, some series connections as well. On the right, what we have is a solar system with our five batteries. You can see that they've used some nice unistrut to kind of create this kind of bracket for it. They're using our, our battery wall brackets, which are the kind of the black brackets. We sell those. Uh, and then you're seeing that midnight solar combiner right there. And again, they're using each battery has conductors of the same gauge and the same length, all feeding up into that midnight solar combiner, which is then feeding out to that solar. And that is a great, beautiful system right there. I really like the way they did that Unistrut. This isn't not as quite hey, Daniel, as, uh, as clean. Yes. Chris, Chris. Chris asks, um, when can we expect this stackable 6.6 .6 kilowatt hour to ship? Will they have closed loop communications? Yes, yes, absolutely. They'll have closed loop communications and they'll be able to, to communicate a lot of the uh, set points and, and uh, auto populate things and, and give a very accurate state of charge uh, to the pieces of equipment that can work with it, really partnering heavily with Solar as well as our inverter as, right, as well. And I believe we're taking pre-orders coming up uh, next month, right, Nathan? Yeah, uh, Chris, I think, you know, we, we don't have a specific date, although it, it will be mid uh, second quarter. Um, so we're talking about just a couple of months out uh, from now. Um, we have a beta test period that needs to finish. And I believe pre-orders are starting at NEPSEP. Um, <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm not sure exactly on that. So yeah, so and, yeah, and we're expecting about about two months. That's a great point, Nathan. And and earlier in my presentation, and I can also go back to it. We had a QR code to get on the mailing list to have all the updates for that new six point six. Uh, will automatically get emailed to you as well. And that does bring up the point. Napsep is going to be our big launch party. We even have an after party on Wednesday night, I believe, um, that will uh, be our big party. So come to Napsep. Come by the booth, get on that mailing list, get a ticket to the after party uh, and, and stay tuned for that 6.6. .6. Really excited about having um, a stacking battery that's able to really quickly go together, integrate all the communications, all of the power cables and, and leverage that in, a, in our inverter and also in our um, uh, the solar converter. But I will kind of just take a moment to, to pause for a second is we still have every plan to continue to provide these five batteries, which is what the conversation today is, is about these off-grid situations. Sure, you could use that stacking battery in an off-grid, but I'm trying to articulate today is, is these five 3.8s have a long, a decade plus history of being leveraged in off-grid situations. They don't have closed loop communications, which in a way is an advantageous because it's lower price 
uh, and when you don't need it for an older piece of equipment. So yes, the stacking battery is excited. I'm excited. And to be frank, uh, on-grid or, or grid-tied battery systems are, are the future, right? But off-grid has always been a part of how this industry got started. It's going to continue to play a role. And Briggs & Stratton Energy Solutions is able to accommodate both of these markets with specific products uh, for both of those as well. Nathan, any comments? I, Questions? I, um... I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, it, you know, you don't always need closed loop communications. And though I do get a kick out of uh, monitoring my Amplify based uh, system, um, I'm also well aware of how well these these batteries hold their charge, et cetera. And, and the five batteries are extremely dependable, extremely well made. Yes. Um, and uh, frankly, um, it, it's really, I, it's it's really about as much as I need to have that, and as long as I have an inverter that does allow me to to check battery voltage, I don't really need to to have closed loop communications on batteries. And so, I, honestly, I, there's a part of me that would prefer um, just the simpler by batteries um, to have a more complicated system to to maintain. That being said, it is certainly fun to get a lot more information about your batteries, about the cells, um, the, the temperature inside, et cetera. Um, but, but I do think, you know, for, for a lower cost system and for a system, you know, that's going to be dependable and reliable, uh, these batteries have a, a very long proven tra track record. Um, and I still believe they make up more than half of our, our battery sales, Daniel. Yeah, and, and these batteries as well, we're one of the few battery manufacturers that actually have been selling batteries longer than their warranty period. Earlier, I said they got a 10-year warranty. We've been selling these batteries for 10 years plus. That's not something that a lot of our competitors in the industry can and say. Another thing a lot of our competitors can't say is that we assemble these batteries in Oxnard, California, Um If anybody ever wants to come out and take a tour of the factory, we're happy to, to show you around. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to quickly run through this last. I apologize for, for kind of running quick. Um, this is a lot more of a mess, um, and I'm, I'm frankly might even take this slide down. Um, I, I like how those, um, those um, I think they're Schneider Xantrex are right in front of that window. What we're looking at here is a bunch of batteries that were replaced with some five batteries as well, um, but that could be a cleaner shop looking this is an old, old slide that that we've still kind of showing. But again, what we're looking on the left is a bunch of um, looks like L16s, uh, six volt batteries that we were able to replace with our simplified batteries. Those are older batteries uh, that look a lot different now. But again, the, the point being is that the picture on the right has just as much power and just as much energy capacity as that picture on the left right there without all the mess as well. So Daniel, I'll yes. just put my vote in that you keep that machine shop in there. And I saw those were the inverters you were looking at. Those are XW Pros, um, the Schneider inverters, really great inverter, um, handles a lot of imbalance. It, it is a transformer inverter, um, but I, I like the real life pictures. You know, we show a lot of marketing pictures as well. Yeah, uh, yeah I didn't think the shop was that messy. You should see mine. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Um, Briggs and Stratton, it, it's a truly global company. We have offices all around the world um, and we have a long history. Uh, so we're really committed to being here for the future. And really we have a, a well-known brand. Um, and, and I think that's gonna be more and more important in the energy storage marketplace as the average homeowner in America will start to recognize uh, the brand. And, and, and that can help you as the salesperson build trust in it. We absolutely make generators and generators can absolutely have always really been leveraged in off-grid situations. Um, we have plenty of um, generator training as well. I'll show you how to access that here in a minute. Showing the Boss 12 in the middle again, there's the Boss 6 on the left, uh, holds six batteries. On the far right is our access cabinet. Essentially, it's the same cabinet, but we took out six batteries and we put a Solark up top. Now, I believe that's a Solark 12K there that you see in the picture, um, but we can also put in our 6K inverter as well. Really makes it easy to install, makes it easy to pass inspection, uh, makes it really easy to kind of make that clean look. And these are outdoor rated if you're not able to put something inside. Nathan hey, mentioned Daniel, um, yes. on, on that question, um, Chris has, Chris asked here, um, do we have heater options with the 6.6? 6? 
I we do not, from what I understand. But I will say this: that the design of the six point six, uh, the the chemistry and some of the form factor enables it to work in a much wider temperature window than historically has been possible with other lithium ion batteries. So in a way, there's not going to be the need for heaters on some, in some climates. I'm not going to say every climate. Uh, and, and also, additionally, we have the ability to um, a, slow down the charge rate to use the internal resistance of the battery to warm itself up. So if you are in one of those extreme climates, uh, we're going to think about putting batteries inside. And if you're really in extreme climate, we're going to think about leveraging um, our fire amplified batteries like you see here and use battery heaters. Anything to add to that, Nathan? Well, I think you did a good job, Daniel. I'll say this. I mean, we, we've changed, you know, there's a slightly different electrolyte that is being used in the 6.6 .6 to allow it to charge um, at lower temperatures, as Daniel mentioned. Um, but I, I will also add that if possible, batteries should be indoors. They're most efficient when they're warmer um, and obviously more reliable if they're warmer. Um, if that is truly a restriction, um, then I would consider then I would consider using either the Amplify or the Phi battery if you really need that heater solution, or maybe just having external temperature control as as you've seen kind of examples from other installers that have that have you know built a room that is heated off the off the power system that's there as well. So there are a number of options you can do. Um, we don't currently have a heater option for the 6.6. .6. That may change in the near future. Yeah. Our engineers are always working to bring new products to the market, um, but we do not have the integrated heater that we have with the Amplify and the Phi battery at this time. I really appreciate that question. I, because that's a great question. Yeah, and, I do and, too. Yeah, and it's it's really something that everybody in this industry should be concerned about, or at least thinking about um, what happens to lithium ion batteries in cold temperatures. And we start to see energy storage systems become more prolific and be installed in all parts of our country, not just our the Californians and our Texas and you know some of the clean energy states. Uh, it, it's going to be a big concern, and, and just know that we're definitely considering it and we're thinking about it as we release these products to you and happy to have more in-depth conversations. Ben Nathan asks yes. on the on the boss cabinet there, is, in the boss cabinet with the Solark, is there any noise from a fan, et cetera? And uh, Ben, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that question if you don't mind. There is some noise from the fan um, and it depends on how fast it's, it, it's running. It's not... Um, it's not running on high all the time, but if you are processing a large amount of solar, um, especially, you know, if that is in, inside, um, there can be noise coming from the system as, as there are with all systems. So there are two, two sets of fans. The Solark has fans in it uh, to dissipate its waste heat. And then the cabinet, if it gets too warm, if there's a temperature control fan inside it, and that fan will, will kick on. Um, yeah. And so, yes, there is some noise from the fan. I don't have decibel ratings for you, Ben, but good question. Um, so thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, again, we're coming up on a couple minutes left. But um, yeah, one thing is that I'd be curious to know why, you know, um, noise is a concern. I, ideally, you don't have these systems installed in a living space. Uh, so I could see the concern about having fans, you know, in a living space. Ideally, these are going to be in a garage, a power shack, um, or some sort of external room as well. But again, I, I definitely hear it. If, if you live off grid, um, noise can absolutely drive somebody crazy. So even if you're sitting out in your, your yard, you don't want to hear something humming along. Um, but yeah, great question. And, and I love that kind of that, um, that concern, that question as well. 4.9 battery, which is on the left there, outdoor rated. Six kilowatt inverter. We didn't really spend a lot of time. We're going to spend a. We're going to go really in depth on an upcoming talk about energy track and how software is becoming much more important as well. Um, the Phi. That's been the talk of the town. This today's talk. Uh, the but we still have that Amplify that does have closed loop. Simplify that does have closed loop, and our six K inverter on the right there as well. It, that six K inverter. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but. That's also a workhorse. It can surge to 12K. It has a very aggressive price point. So if you want to get somebody in the game, 
Uh, our six key inverter is a perfect uh, opportunity to get somebody uh, back feeding to the grid, doing time of use arbitrage, um, and providing them the backup resiliency for grid down situations as well. Generators, absolutely available. Uh, we have generators that operate uh, on natural gas and propane. They're, these are standby generators, and they don't derate when they start to run on natural gas, which is really exciting. We call that technology NG Max as well. Uh, we have a very aggressive warranty on these generators as well, um, where we cover not just the, the parts, um, but also your mileage, the labor, and, and that can be really crucial because when you got to pay um, two people in a van to drive, you know, half a day down the road to fix something, you want to be compensated for that. Uh, so we have that most comprehensive warranty. Um, also talk a little bit about noise. We're, we're able to really kind of reduce some of the noise on these ones as well. It's generator still going to be noisy no matter what. I invite anybody that's on this call right now to please consider joining our simplifier installer program. We'll put your company on our store locator maps. You will qualify for a hundred dollar back uh, per battery. So every one of those five batteries that we were talking about, you get a hundred dollars cash back. We'll send you a check. Uh, I believe it's 60 days after you order. Scan this. The kind of details are all on the website as well. Uh, we'll promote your, your company as well in social media. Additionally, if this is your first time installing our product, scan this QR code. We're offering $1,000 to install your first system. It doesn't have to be our inverter. It can also be a solar converter as well. Um, and additionally, in California, we have opportunity to take care of that self-generation incentive program. That, that program has been refunded with some of the new net metering agreements that came down in California. Uh, and we're able to meet some of the uh, California manufacturing requirements as well. Scan that QR code as well. Additionally, I mentioned it earlier that we have um, a, a, another um, opportunity to learn, and that's Power Academy. Briggs and Stratton Power Academy has in-person ones where you can sign up, come visit us. We, we have a trailer that we tow around the country and we do in-person all-day sessions. We have e-learning, live, and also virtual courses as well. It is free to sign up. Please consider doing that as well. Um, Coming up um, were some other, um, what we're doing today is March. Um, we have some upcoming opportunities as well uh, for more future trainings. Another thing additionally is we want to have your feedback. Uh, take this survey. It helps Nathan and I be better at doing our jobs, makes the content better, uh, helps us. What we didn't talk about, maybe we talked about something uh, too much that you didn't really care about. So take this survey. It helps us be better. Uh, even if it's critical feedback, that's okay because we it helps us be better and we always want to make something, uh, this, this time together is valuable and we want to make sure we convey the information that you find important. There's the link to the survey as well. Energy storage training at basco.com. Energy storage training at Briggs and Stratton Company. That's what Basco stands for. Um, please email your questions if you want to place an order. You got questions about the 6.6 .6 and you want to get on the mailing list. I'll, I'll email this email and I'll make sure that I sign you up as well. Uh, there's our phone number to talk to some of our application engineers as well. Nathan, any closing thoughts um, on our off-grid um, battery replacement with lithium-ion batteries? Any more questions? Well, I would just say that we're one of the few companies uh, that does warranty our systems to an off-grid. Yeah. Um, and Great we've point. got a long track record of success with these five batteries. I, I know we're over time, so I want to get Chris's question in here. He asks, what is the smallest liquid-cooled gen set that we provide? So liquid-cooled, um, I believe it's 30 kilowatts. And, and so liquid-cooled is inherently going to be a larger a generator as well. So there is, a, when, when you start to get to the higher end of the uh, air-cooled and then the lower end of the liquid-cooled, you almost get kind of get there. Uh, I'm not the expert in that. Email us, please, and I'll, I'll set you up with um, um, some of the generator, more generator experts, and we'll figure out what works for your application as well. Uh, I know the liquid cooled runs at a lower RPM, so they're inherently more quiet, uh, but you, they are physically larger because you have to have um, a big radiator and all the other parts and pieces that go with it. 
Thank you, everyone. For All right. Joining thank us. you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.